Well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, two thirds of the world lives under dictatorship, yet we know very little about dictators. We make the assumption that all dictators and dictatorships are the same, and yet we know that that's not the case. So the purpose of this talk is to explain how dictatorships are different, uh, and then try to explore what the significance is of these differences. So for example, why do some leaders step down from power really peacefully, while other leaders cling to power until the very bitter end? So in order to do so, we're gonna take a look at the different types of dictatorships, and you can see here, we're getting it. We first define dictatorship under Barbara Getty's definition of any regime that has no turnover in power of the executive. But there are a lot of different types of dictatorships and this is determined by who leads them. So you can look at who is leading them. Is it a political party, like China's Communist Party? Is it a military junta, like some of the military juntas that were in charge of Argentina during the 1970s and 80s? Is it one leader, which we refer to as a personalist dictatorship, which I'm gonna go into more the definition in a little bit. And in this case, it's just one leader that controls everything. Is it a monarchy or a ruling family like in Saudi Arabia? And sometimes there's different hybrids of all these different, um, different groups. So you can look here above, we have different pictures of dictators and the different types here. You can see there's Matu Karaku of, uh, of Benin and he's a personalist dictatorship and underneath him is Trujillo of Dominican Republic. Um, in the middle below, you have Lee Kuan Yew, who for many years led the si Singapore under the PAP, and he led a single party regime. Then on the top, you can see Algeria's military dictatorship and also Argentina's military dictatorship. And then in the bottom, you have a monarchy that is led by King Abdul in Saudi Arabia. So a lot of the differences uh, with dictatorships come from the structure, which I just mentioned. But another thing that's really interesting to explore is the threats. And most of the threats for dictators actually come from within the regime. So here we have a picture of Pinochet. And in the back, he has some of his military leaders who are most of the people who would be most threatening to him. There's an assumption that revolutions just take place all over the place and dictators fall because there's this massive explosion of people who decide that they're tired of dictatorship, they push for the dictator to leave, and, and then that's how he gets ousted from power. But the biggest threat to a dictator is actually come from within the regime, the people that have the most potential to, to stage a coup and to oust the leader from power. The other thing is that the survival then of this leader depends then on the relationship between him and his elites. So how do dictators rise to power? Well, they need a launching organization. This launching organization could be a military, uh, like in the case of Argentina's military junta, or it could be a single party. <clears throat> now, to gain power is a lot easier, of course, when democratic institutions are weak. And the launching organization, if it's really, really weak, then you're gonna see a dictator concentrating power more and more tightly into his own hands, and then that's where you see the dictatorship will become personalist. So some examples of personalist dictatorship include, I mean, they're all over the world. A lot of them are highly concentrated in Africa, of course, like Mobutu of Zaire, Idi Amin of Uganda. Uh, in the Caribbean, you had Francois Duvalier of uh, Haiti, Gaddafi of Libya, Saddam Hussein of Iraq, Rafael Trujillo of the Dominican Republic, Jean Bedel Bukasa of Central African Republic, and, and in Asia you had uh, Ferdinand Marcos of the Philippines. <coughs> so we're gonna explore some questions. What types of dictatorships are the most durable? Which are the ones that last the longest? Uh, in which type of dictatorship is the process of leadership transition the smoothest? And also we're gonna even explore what types of dictatorship are more prone to kleptocracy or stealing in, in large volumes. So if we look at personalist dictatorship, once the personalist dictator is in power, he is very, very consumed with staying in power. And because there are no institutionalized mechanisms for secession to hand over power to someone else, he becomes more and more paranoid. So he does everything he can to eliminate potential rivals. He could deliberately weaken the military, which is known as coup proofing the regime. Um, the military could be weakened by not having training, by not having access to weapons, or by creating a parallel military organization to offset the power of the traditional military. And he can also weaken his own political party deliberately by ousting those that have the most expertise or those that have the potential to possibly challenge him. The other thing that the personalist dictator may want to weaken is the legislative branch and the judicial branch. So the courts are deliberately weakened by 
selecting people who are going to listen to what he has to say, or he can threaten them uh, with their life or with their job if they don't make decisions that he agrees with. And he can also weaken the legislature by literally deciding who gets to run for office, who gets to be in a particular office, purging individuals that he finds to be disruptive or challenging to him. And then the other thing that is weakened is the bureaucracy. He may weaken the bureaucracy by playing musical chairs with the individuals that are a part of the bureaucracy by putting them in a position for just a couple years and then putting them in another position, firing them, hiring them again, making them feel completely insecure and creating a very chaotic environment. So he'll weaken the bureaucracy so much that it barely is even functioning. And the purpose of this is that he doesn't want any group of people to be able to have any kind of expertise or ability to challenge him. So the dictator actually prefers, in the personalist case, where you just have one person ruling, they actually prefer disorganized chaos to dealing with a host of organized groups. So as a result, the regime is completely deinstitutionalized and completely personalized under the power of this one particular leader. Now that brings me to that third question that I was talking about, that which types of regimes are more kleptocratic? And the answer is personalist regimes of all the different types of dictatorships are the most kleptocratic, meaning they steal a lot from their own people. So because personalist regimes, they, the personalist dictator, they see life in power as very fleeting. They, they even think that they may have a violent exit, and they're right. They will have a very violent exit, which I'll get to later. So because they see their time horizon is really short, they decide that while they're in power, they're going to hoard as much as possible while they have the chance to. And they'll hoard in large volumes. But the other aspect of personalist dictatorship, what leads to more kleptocratic behavior, is that there are absolutely no checks on this person's power to ensure or prevent the dictator from stealing. So they can steal large amounts of money, and no one says anything about it. And then that makes things even worse, because then a culture of corruption develops where they just sort of allow this type of large um, amounts of wealth to be stolen with nothing being said about it. The other thing has to do with the mode of exit. The mode of exit in the personalist dictatorship, because institutions are extremely weak, there's no mechanisms of power sharing or secession uh, or of transitioning from one leader to the next, the mode of exit is extremely violent. And I'll get to a little bit later why that's the case with some examples. The dictator constantly sort of lives in fear of this. So another type of dictatorship are single party regimes and monarchies. Now I group them together because they function really similarly. Unlike a personalist dictatorship where it's just one person that holds all the power, that has deinstitutionalized the regime completely, and all the decisions are being made by one person with no checks on their power, the single party regimes and the monarchies have a lot of people that are making decisions. They have uh, family members in monarchies that are fairly large that are working and consulting with one another and making decisions. And in a single party regime, it's a huge amount of people that are working together to make decisions. And as a result, policy output is very slow. It takes a while for policies and decisions to be made, but these decisions are made with a lot of discussion. <clears throat> so many leaders in monarchies and single party dictatorships, and maybe to a lesser extent military dictatorships, have decided as well, because there's so many people involved, to implement some form of institutionalized secession. For example, the PRI in Mexico will only allow the president to be in power for six years. So they decided that no one person can have so much concentration of power into their hands. China's leadership is also institutionalized secession. So every 10 years, you know there's going to be a very uh, smooth type of transition from one leader to the next. The same has happened with the PAP in Singapore. They've institutionalized secession. The rules are very clear. And you know who's going to be in power um, in a very seamless process. So therefore, the leader is not as paranoid as the personalist dictator is of how they're going to die or how they're going to get rid, get, um, or how they're going to leave power. So for example, the single party leader, they know that there's rules of how they're going to get ousted, uh, that it's probably going to happen either every six years or every 10 years or at a certain point in time. And they know that they're going to be able to leave um, with you know, their life intact, and they can go on and continue to be a politician in the party or decide to retire. So other members of the party are also able to check the power of the leader much better, and that prevents them from hoarding everything, from stealing everything. So you don't see anywhere near as much kleptocratic behavior with this type of dictatorships as you do with personalist dictatorships. The other thing that's important, and this isn't always the case, but in many cases, the process of breaking down 
takes a very long time. It's very protracted, and there's a lot of negotiation involved. And often, it's pacted, too. It's rare and pacted. And by pacted, it means that the elites and the opposition are working with one another, and they're making <clears throat> compromises and trying to figure out who's going to get what. And it takes a very long time to decide how that's going to happen. In military regimes, they don't really want to be in power for that long. In fact, when you look at military regimes across the world, their average duration that they're in power is by far the, the least of any different type of dictatorship. In fact, the average is only about two and a half years. So they'll seize power quickly in a coup, and then they decide, well, you know what, I don't really want to run the country because it's, it's not what we're meant to do. So they want to go back to the barracks, particularly if their corporate unity has been threatened. And what I mean by that is if they feel that they're no longer unified because running things and, and being in power creates splits within their corporation, they're going to feel like, well, you know, we don't really want this. So we're going to go back to what our day job was. They also don't want to upset the legitimacy and the hierarchy uh, in, within the military. So they may decide, well, running things and, and, and ruling and, and being involved in politics does upset our hierarchies and does cause us to lose legitimacy among the public. And so therefore, we should just step down while we're still considered somewhat legitimate. The other aspect of why they may move back, and I think I've already mentioned this before, is they do have a day job. The personalist dictator does not have a day job. They don't see any life after politics. And because of that, it makes it more difficult for them to leave. The other thing is that the dictator can exit on more favorable terms. So they may decide that they have a lot of bargaining power because right now they're not considered to be so terrible to the population that if they exit now, they can still wage a lot of power behind the scenes and have a huge military budget, which is really what their main preference is. Now, one thing to note is when the military has been communally recruited, that means they're recruited along ethnic lines or religious lines, like the Syrian military in, in the case of Syria that's recruited mostly Alawites, they're going to be less likely to give up power, especially if this particular ethnic group, religious group, or sect is tied to the regime. They don't see that they do have an exit. They think that if they leave power, they could be punished just like the leader would be punished. So you're going to see these types of militaries more likely to cling to power for a very long time. The other thing that's really important to note about military regimes is that the process of democratization is extremely bumpy. And it goes in a zigzag fashion. They will leave power very quickly, and then they'll come back. And then they'll leave power quickly, and then come back. And you see that they never really want to leave. They've gotten used to ruling. They're comfortable with it. They don't want to do it forever. And they're going to come back and forth, and that creates a lot of instability. And I'll give you some example of that at the end. So when will a dictator step down? The key question is, well, what's his life going to be like after politics? Does he have a day job? Is he going to die? Is he going to go to jail? Um, and so this makes it much less likely that the dictator is going to step down if he feels like he's going to face a life in exile, jail, or be killed. In rare cases, the dictator is able to engineer his own retirement. And when they do this, they may create themselves a very important position as some sort of elder or statesman. Uh, maybe they can run things with their party behind the scenes. And we've seen this in the case of like Julius Nairi in Tanzania, who stepped down peacefully. And then he was sort of an elder statement for uh, his political party in Tanzania. Jerry Rawlings of Ghana also did this. And then he was given, though he was very brutal at the time that he ruled, he was given a lot of acclaim for stepping down early and has been able to tour the continent and be an important speaker. So why is the mode of transition so violent for these personalist leaders? I've already touched upon it a little bit. But they've been surrounded by sycophants. That means fawning fans or entourage for, for decades in some cases. And these sycophants are just reporting to them falsehoods and lies and telling them what they want to hear. And so then this can shape the personality to make the dictator even more narcissistic and delusional than they may already be. And so this is exemplified definitely with the case of Gaddafi and Hussein, who both wanted their um, entourage to give them false reports false information about everything, telling them that they are the best, that they're the greatest, that they uh, need to be in power forever, that uh, anyone that tried to challenge them was going to die, that any of their enemies were weak. And the longer that these types of dictators stay in power, the more they believe that they are one with the state. They personify the state. They can't see any life outside of being one with the state. So because they can't separate from themselves from the state, they have a very difficult time stepping down. 
And in most cases, like you see with Gaddafi and with uh, Hussein, they cling to power until the very end. And, and they see just no other life for themselves. There's a small subset of the population of personal dictators that have led for decades and decades and get to this point. But if they've had the chance to lead for long periods of time, then you see this type of very, very delusional behavior. So what are the paths that authoritarian leaders can choose? They can decide, OK, we're going to preemptively step down and reform, die in office, or which is obviously not their choice, or be forced out. And there's all different types of ways that they can be forced out. They can be deposed in a coup. They can be forced to resign by elites. They can be assassinated. They can be uh, ousted in a conflict. There can be a very violent uh, revolution that takes place. There can be an international intervention. And there can be nonviolent protests. So the chances of being forced out are actually very high in dictatorships. And the next slide will, will illustrate this. So the fall of dictators, really only under 20% actually reform on their own, and then under 10% go by some sort of nonviolent protest. 20% um, violent, 20% uh, just die in office. But the rest are forced out in a way that's not on their terms, and that could be very violent. You can see that there are many assassinations, forced resignations, coups and assassinations. Um, the biggest percentage is, of course, coups. That's the number one way in which most dictators leave power. And then it could be some sort of violent protest or intervention that takes place. So the types of dictatorships that are the smoothest, that are going to be less kleptocratic, are single party dictatorships. So we see they're able to manage secession better. There are a lot more checks on their power. And so therefore, the transitions are smooth. The issue is that the transition can take a very, very long time. And we have some examples of that with China, with Singapore, with Tanzania, and Senegal, and the different parties that are responsible for managing these transitions are listed there. On the final slide, I'm going to talk about authoritarian breakdown in, in North Africa. With the Libyan case, it was a personal regime under Gaddafi. And it was violent in the way he fell. He was very kleptocratic when he was in power. And because there are absolutely no institutions, the transition to democracy has been very, very difficult. Mubarak led a military regime. They left quickly, but we're seeing the zigzag behavior continue. That they're leaving, they come back, they're leaving, they come back. And then Tunisia had a single party leader, and that one has the best chance of reform. So the end of the talk illustrates one important thing, that in dictatorships, institutions matter. Thank you.